We encourage you to hit the subscribe button right now so you can listen to more podcasts of Operation Truth. Ladies and gentlemen, we do want to hear from you, so we encourage you to email us at directly at operationtruthofficial at gmail.com. I want you to know that your messages are likely to be heard, addressed, and listened to on air. Operation Truth, the show they don't want you to see. Now, here's your host, Lou. Hi, everyone. This is Lou Palumbo with me as always, my co-host, Tom Fuentes. As you can see, I'm communicating with you from Mars, lonely out in space. Tom is still on the Earth, so I'm sure he'll keep it together first. We have quite a number of interesting things to speak to you about today. Um, they're all critically important. You know, I, I want to open up with this conversation, as always, with the borders, but we're going to would it put it on the side for a moment and talk to you about this issue of register voters uh, voter registration it's being suggested that you be permitted to vote without identifying yourself which begs the question how would we know who you are number one i don't understand any mentality attached to any process that lacks integrity and if there's anything that lacks integrity it's this inability to know someone who's actually in a polling station voting is eligible to vote. With that being said, um, in addition, they want to have mail-in ballots, which just lends itself to fraud. I know, Tom, you probably have some sentiment uh, based on that. You care to share your views, Tom? Yeah. Who is suggesting this, Lou? Who might that be? Could it be hmm. Democrats by any chance? If so, say no more. They're looking to cheat. They always cheat. And they're trying to really cheat this time in 2024 because they're so far behind in the polls and they don't like it. So that's why I get aggravated even hearing about this stuff, because they're just finding ways to cheat. Whether it's having the election last for two months, whether it's drop boxes, mail in, no ID, everything they're doing is designed to cheat. You know, tragically, Tom, it's hard to argue with your concerns. Um, I would like to say we live in a society today where we never question the integrity of our elections, but I go back and remind everyone of this fact. This is irrefutable. Don't take Tom on his word, me on my word. The reality of it is Bernie Sanders accused the Democrats of undermining his primary efforts when he was running against Hillary Clinton. And what transpired was giving Hillary Clinton the, the questions on two separate occasions prior to the primary debates, which were being held on, CN on CNN's network. That resulted in Donald Brazil being dismissed. Guys, you have to take responsibility here. And that's that's a concept or a notion that applies to both sides of the aisle. This isn't a one-sided one conversation. Tom and I are not speaking to you as Democrats or Republicans. We're speaking to you as Americans. You can't question this man's dedication to this country. He spent almost 30 years, along with other extremely credible FBI agents like Chris Schwecker and, and Kevin Brock protecting this company. I'm just mentioning a couple of names. I could rattle off a cadre of them dedicated to keeping this country safe. And we have, um, I would say, a concerted effort underway to undermine everything that defines who we are as a nation, who uh, stabilizes this nation. And I hate to say it to you, Tom, but when you brought up that, that term Democrat, you are 100 percent right. This is part of their agenda, which I don't understand. Why wouldn't you think? That's why, Lou, I didn't, I didn't want to take 15 minutes to say what could be said in about 30 seconds. The Democrats are trying to cheat. Next question. I, I can't argue with you, Tom. And I think for everyone who's listening to this, take this as food for thought. Go out and do your own investigating. You'll find that everything that's been conveyed to you at this point is, uh, is completely accurate and truthful. On another issue, which is this whole immigration discussion, on, on top of the normal day-to-day normal day uh, issues we're having at the southern border of the United States, we now have an issue with Haiti. As a result of its destabilization, we have Haitian migrants heading towards our shores. If you can arbit arbitrate that, if you choose, or listen to what transpired a week or so ago in Haiti, where they interdicted a boatload of Haitians, approximately 25 of them, armed, 
in possession of drugs and night vision. The reason I have night vision, ladies and gentlemen, is it allows them to navigate the waters a little more easily at nighttime. In other words, when you're on, on the sea uh, with these boats, these vessels, you need to be able to identify or locate buoy markers. But, Tom, th this just adds to the fervor of this whole immigration policy of ours that is failing this country and something that you have to be mindful of. It's not only doing our disserv a disservice to our country, to our major cities that are in distress. Listen to the mayors, Chicago, Boston, Detroit, you know, Denver, pick, pick a place. It's doing a disservice to these people we're bringing here under false pretense. We have no way to take care of them unless burdening the American public from a, from a fi financial position and as far as housing goes and medicine is somehow an aid. Well, I'm sure you have an opinion on this. Yeah, I agree with you. That's that my opinion. I, I agree that, well, you get tired of saying the same stuff over and over. This is terrible, what they're doing, how they're trying to get these people in. There's always a crisis somewhere in these third world countries. It just happens that we have a couple of these third world countries within a couple hundred miles of our borders in the Caribbean. Now, Cuba, obviously, we had refugee problems with them going back you know, many years. And Cuba is only 100 miles from South Florida. Haiti is about 800 miles. So when these people take to the boats, that's a very dangerous trip, especially with all of the storms in the Caribbean and everything else. So you have Governor DeSantis in Florida saying, OK, we're going to try to interdict these boats and then keep them from landing on our shores where they can claim or try to claim asylum or refugee status. Well, OK, so let's say the Coast Guard and, and DeSantis said he's actually working with the Federal Coast Guard, has worked with them in the past. Let's say they intercept these boats like, the, like they did here. And if they're within 100 miles of the shore of Florida, then they're 700 miles away from Haiti. So if they turn them around as they go home and then that boat, the people it tips over and they drown, then what? Then we have a humanitarian crisis. The U.S. murdered all of these potential refugees. And in the case of the Haitians, at least the, the good citizens, if you can figure out how to vet them, you know, how are you going to know who's who? You might say that that boat that came that was intercepted was, was probably good Haitians, true refugees in fear of their lives if they stayed in Haiti. Well, in that case, though, they've got night vision and they've got hand grenades, you know, and other equipment with them, explosives equipment. So now what do you do with them? So we're going to see. We're going to see how far DeSantis can get, how far before the, the Biden administration calls off the Coast Guard and said, by the way, Coast Guard, you're not helping the state of Florida anymore. By, uh, DeSantis will be on his own to protect his own shores. Well, he's deployed 250 National Guardsmen so far um, because of concern at the Keys, the access, immediate access uh, through the Keys. But, um, you know, Tom, where's the federal government? Where's the discussion with the federal government? You know, I have to ask you another question, which you probably can give a very simple, short answer to. I heard a figure as high as, 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 high as $300 million uh, being given to Haiti. I'm just curious, but... Who was that given to? I mean, we have no government in Haiti right now. You funneled three hundred million, or twenty million, or two million. Where's that money going to? I mean, this is just like something in the Ukraine. I don't want to tangentialize off into the discussion about the Ukraine and its lack of accountability for one hundred thirteen billion dollars. But who are they giving this money to in Haiti? No idea. I don't think they have an idea. It's just that they can say publicly, oh, look, we're trying to give money. We're humanitarian <laughs> assistance to the people of Haiti. Doesn't matter who they are. It could be this guy, the gang leader, that's been killing and eating opponents. The guy, the guy called Barbecue actually kills his opponents and then cooks them, you know, on and on. Use your imagination. So this is one of the big leaders in Haiti. Are we giving him the money? Do we give him money not to, to stop eating his opponents? Who knows? I don't know who they're giving it to. I don't think they know who they're giving it to. You know, Tom, maybe that's the exercise. They're going to try to buy their way out of this thing by by buying 
these Haitian warlords or gangs or whatever they are into some form of better behavior, which is another practice we've employed in other parts of the world. This wouldn't be the first time at the rodeo for this country. That's true. Has, and how but, well has it worked all over the world? How it, successful it have they been? It doesn't, Tom. That's the whole point. No, that's it. just it. And we have the same idiots working in the State Department that we've had for years under the leadership of the same president for the last three plus years who absolutely doesn't know what he's doing. And we know he doesn't know what he's doing. So who are we following? Blind leading the blind? I, I wish it were that positive, Tom. It would be something like the blind leading the blind. But you and I both know this country is, is as misguided as it's ever been in the history of the country. And I have to tell you something interesting. I listened to Ken Langone on an, on a Neil Cavuto inter, uh, interview for at least a half hour. He wasn't very flattering towards Trump nor Biden. He did give Trump credit, as Jamie Dimon did, for a lot of the things he did during his administration that were positive. His concern is the same concern that many of us express. It lends itself to demeanor and language. But he did make a point of saying, you know, they're accusing Donald Trump of uh, getting elected and then going on vengeance. And he made a very interesting response to that, which Langone acknowledged in a very positive way, which leads me to believe there might be some hope in uh, salvaging, salvaging his relationship with Ken Langone. But he said that our revenge will be our success. And that was an incredibly good response. And it wasn't a plan or a stage response. I really think that's where his brain is, you know, independent, ladies and gentlemen, of, of everybody's personal disdain for this man. And I understand where it's rooted. And I'm not saying it isn't well rooted. This guy loves this country. I know that's a very bizarre concept to wrap your arms around based on the way he behaves or he addresses people. But please trust me, he does. You know, he's likened to a doctor with very poor bedside matter. But what I've said before in this podcast, I want to say again before we go back to the general uh, consensus of opinion about this administration, um, we we talk about Donald Trump and his demeanor and his behavior. Guys, let us revisit Bill Clinton and Juanita Broderick, who accused him of rape. Paula Jones, Jennifer Flowers, Kathleen Wiley, and my client, Monica Lewinsky. And none of us are offended by that. Where was the National Organization of Women? Maybe what we're living today is one big lie and a massive amount of hypocrisy. By the way, I said this before on the podcast. So I'm going to keep saying it until people get the memo. Do you want to talk about a family that's soulless? Look at the Biden family. It's nothing to do with politics now. It's not about his border policy or the economy or uh, the energy sector or any of the above. His son fathered a child with London Roberts. That little girl, four years old, now resides in the state of Arkansas, has never met her grandfather and never met her father. And they do nothing but exercise uh, in denying who she is until they were shamed by their own people in the media the following given acknowledgement. Guys, don't talk to me about Donald Trump unless you want to talk to me about the whole picture. And I got the memo in Trump. I really, truly did. I got it. I got it. I got it. But independent of that, Look at the objectivity of the last administration. Look at the condition of this country today versus the condition of this country from three and a half years ago, roughly. It is completely different. And you can hate him all you want. The problem is it doesn't change the truth. And I have to tell you something. I am well past the point as I don't want to speak for Tom, but I'm sure Tom is that way as well. I'm not interested in anybody's personal lives. We elect individuals to run and lead this country in a way that is in the best interest of its citizens and most importantly, the future of our children, which is the driving force in this in this podcast. Pay attention, guys. We're at a we're at a crossroad. This is the defining moment of this country, plain and simple. And if you don't get on board and, and sadly, um, I will finish what Ken Langone said, by the way, he said he's going to vote for his wife although he seems to be softening his position with Donald Trump. Another observation he made, he said, Joe Biden, because I would never vote for Joe Biden under any circumstances. And here's a really telling com uh, comment from the owner of uh, Home Depot and Ken NYU Langone Hospitals, which are state-of-the-art hospitals in New York City and other places. He said, and I don't want to quote him, but what he said simplistically, 
was that Joe Biden will go down as the worst and most dangerous president in the history of this country. And that's not a lie, tragically. Guys, we don't elect our uh, public officials to fail us, but it seems to be a common denominator across the board. And I hate to say it, on both sides of the aisle oftentimes, I think they lose focus to the exercise. The exercise is to do what's best, first and foremost, by our children to afford them a future, which we're denying them. You can argue with you all you want. When you all go out there and start voting for Donald, uh, excuse me, for Joe Biden in this election, election cycle, and I'm not telling you vote for Trump. I'm telling you see the forest for the trees. We won't survive another four-year term of the Democrats. Guys, you need to take a look at this border issue, and it just amplifies every single day. We have members of cartels in our country carrying weapons. It is irrefutable. We now have the issue that we just alluded to about Haiti. Where does it stop? And as I've said to you before, where in the Constitution, where did the founding fathers ever express the sentiment that we would allow everybody from all over the planet, 190 plus con countries, to come here whenever they feel like it, legally, illegally, and we were going to keep everybody happy. We were going to, I would say, tend to everybody's ethnicity, their religious denomination, their culture, their lifestyle. Where do we get this warped, perverted notion? And, you know, and Lou, the, the founding ahead, fathers Tom. never invented envisioned that we would have leaders that want to destroy the United States. That's unfathomable to them. We're building this new democracy. It's a new experiment. It's going to go well. We're going to succeed. How did they envision that 250 years later, we would, we would elect a brain-dead president who's incompetent, immoral, corrupt, and put him in charge of our country, and his goal is to bring us down. Now, you you keep talking about, you know, where, you know, who's looking at our children? Who, here's a guy who can't take care of his own, he, well, he partially took care of his own children and grandchildren with crooked money coming in from China and Ukraine and other countries. But like the little girl you're talking about, that he wouldn't acknowledge as his granddaughter, and he didn't want his son to acknowledge as his daughter, so where is the care of all of our children or all God's children? There isn't any. It's hypocrisy. It's corruption, hypocrisy, combined with incompetence. So no wonder we have people that are major CEOs of good companies saying that it's the most competent, incompetent president we've ever had, coupled with the most crooked president we've ever had. Put that combination together. Founding fathers never had a clue. They might have had their differences with each other whether it was Jefferson versus Madison versus Washington, but they didn't, they didn't presume their opponents to be evil and in need of destruction. And that's what we have now with the prosecutions of Trump, with all of the things that the uh, taking down our border protections, all of that. This is an administration that's bent on Marxism and the destruction of the United States. Well, I can't Thank argue you. with you, Tom. I, I, I will say, um, as much as I do respect you, you know how fond I am of you and how much I respect your your intellect. You're a bit hard on the president, periodically, <laughs> but perhaps rightfully so. You, think, you yeah. think I'm not acknowledging great things that he's accomplished? Point about. out. I'll listen. I'm open-minded. Tell me how great he is. Tell me why you think he's so great. I, I say the same thing, Tom. I ask oh, people, okay. Okay. Tell me tell me what it is that's gone right in this country that we're, we're all benefiting from or experiencing. But I want to bump into a, a little assessment you made of the president uh, regarding competency. And that now brings me into this conversation about hearings in which the special counsel her spoke to. So, you know, you being who you are based on background and having managed skips and being able to classify information, et cetera, et cetera, I'm trying to understand how we glossed over, and I blame the Republicans on this, to be candid with you, over this simple single issue of the United States senator in possession of classified documents. That is a felony. There's no gray area. We don't need a special counsel. And here's it. Let me tie it in a bow for everybody. If you are not sufficiently competent to stand trial and be held accountable for your actions, you should not be allowed to lead this nation and have access to the codes that have access to nuclear weapons. Period. End of discussion. Where's the conversation? 
Where's the outrage? I got the whole deal with Donald Trump. I keep hearing about it every day when I talk to people and I try to talk us, talk them into some sensible thinking. The response is no matter what's gone wrong in this country, Donald Trump, Donald Trump, Donald Trump. I got the memo. He, he doesn't have the appropriate bedside manner. I got it. But at the end of the day, look at the condition of the country and the direct direction, the trajectory of this country. You know, Tom, not for anything. I know you probably listened to these uh, hearings with her. I'm still trying to reconcile why we're we not talking about removing him from office. This man testified that this man is not competent to stand trial based on his interview, which is the same thing that's done in our legal system in a general sense, although at times we then enlist the services of individuals like psychologists or psychiatrists that can make a clinical evaluation. What is the process here, Tom? And why aren't why is Lou, the reason the reason is simple? The Democrats and the Republicans do agree on one thing that at no time should they put the country in the hands of Kamala Harris. She makes Biden look like Einstein. So that's why. That was the smartest thing. The one smart thing, and I don't know if Biden did it on his own intellect, was picking Kamala Harris. Because you look at the low ratings of Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, is, hers are lower. You look at what people think of her, they don't want any part of her being in the White House. And the fear that even Democrats have, which is why they have not pulled the trigger on, the, on the, going after Biden on the 25th Amendment or going after Biden on impeachment, is they don't even want Kamala Harris to be president for one month, because then... She becomes an independent, uh, indep um, sorry, she, you know, has the, the White House, let's say. She becomes an incumbent, and, she'll, and the black female base of the Democratic Party is really strong. So if she ends up in the White House in August, how are they going to not vote for her in November? And that's the problem that the country has, Democrats and Republicans. It's a get-out-of-jail-free card for Joe Biden. Because nobody, Democrat or Republic, Republican, want Kamala Harris. You know, Tom, I hear what you're saying. I agree with the logic. To be very candid with you, I think you're onto something there. But at the end of the day, if the process leads us to Kamala Harris, then that's what the process should do. In other words, I know it's like picking lesser of evils, or in this instance, it isn't an exercise of even evil. I mean, as incompetent as Joe Biden has demonstrated he is, she's worse. This poor young girl can't put a sentence together. But ladies and gentlemen, I don't want to smear her, but I do want to tell you something you might want to investigate. Look into her relationship with Willie Brown, more cordially referred to as downtown Willie Brown in San Francisco, and how she was ushered into politics. And that's all I'm going to say. Go take a look yourself. You know, I wish I could say Kamala Harris was the only person holding office that shouldn't be holding office. We have a, a, a list of these, I hate to say it again, young women and a couple of men, but a lot of young women that are so hateful, they're prepared to destroy the country to accomplish a mission, which is keeping Donald Trump from being the president. You know, I tell you something else, Tom, and I'm sure you agree with this. I'm worried about the polls because the polls appear to be valueless. Starting in 2016, they had Hillary Clinton walking all over Donald Trump. Not true. November 8th, 2022, midterms, the big red, red wave. Not true. Last November, the Republicans got smacked around again because they're not smart enough to know how to navigate this pro-choice issue, which, by the way, Trump happened to come out and say, let's assign 16 weeks and continue to have some conversations. But the reality of it all is the country's on a collision course. You know, I want to bump back into DeSantis for one second, if I may, because we spoke about what he's doing to address the migrants. In the state of Florida, there are no more squatters' rights. Guys, I have been retained, my services retained to address squatters. I won't tell you how I address them. You won't like it. Not that I care. But this is a major problem. I had them in Malibu, California. I had them in the Pacific Palisades in California with affluent people, some of them in very prominent positions in the entertainment industry. The state of Florida, they're going to evict you from that property, and they possibly are going to criminally charge you. That's one thing. Um, the management mechanism in Florida is more to 
benefit the citizens in the state of Florida than it is these demographics of individuals that think we, you know, you can just get a free ride. You know, I don't understand what the rest of the country doesn't understand. But I will say this to you guys. I don't think there's a better managed country than the state of Florida, period. And I know people are going to jump up and down about Gavin Newsom. Before you do that, go look at the the deficit this year, $68 billion. And more importantly, look at how much they're in debt, $1.6 trillion, coming from an individual that will tell you we have the fifth largest economy. Corporations come here to flourish. That's just a bold-faced lie. Corporate entities are leaving in record numbers. 21 of them have left the San Francisco Bay Area for reasons I don't have to explain to you. You can't find a moving truck in California to hire to leave. They'll pay you to bring them in. So when we start talking politics and the truth, which is really what the show's, the show's about, take a look at the condition of California as well as the federal government. Tom, I, I want to get into this um, discussion about Chuck Schumer now and his de decision to insinuate himself into the political environment of Israel. I guess now, and Tom, you are probably well aware of this. We've both spoke, spoken about assassinations, this being done in a different form. Now it's incumbent upon us to make an assessment of a foreign country and if the policies and the manner in which their leadership is conducting himself or herself, we will then encourage a process to have them removed. Did I miss something here, Tom? No. No. What Schumer and the rest of the Democrats are looking at is on the one hand, oh, yeah, we should support Israel. We've always been their strongest supporter, <laughs> democracy in the Middle East, and a great ally in the Middle East and all of that. But when they see these protests in the United States of young people, even Jewish young people, praising Palestine and Hamas and all of that, and saying they're not gonna vote. And now you have the Biden administration concerned that they they might not get the vote in Minnesota or Michigan or some of the areas that have larger Arab populations or Palestinian populations. So suddenly now they're coming up with this, well, the young people don't like Netanyahu, so let's call for a reelection in Israel. Let's call for, for Israel to change course, have new leadership and all of that. Now. All of the top pundits have said that the rest of the war cabinet in Israel that will still be in power, whether Netanyahu is there or not, still are going to support the policies in Gaza to wipe out Hamas in Gaza. And that policy is not going to change. The invasion of Gaza by the Israeli Defense Force, that's not going to change. But they just want to get Netanyahu. They, they want to make it look like to the young Arab, the young Palestinian supporters in the United States, we're doing something. We're trying to change the policy. We're trying to stop the genocide in Gaza, all of that. So yet again, it's a hypocritical show on the part of the Democrats to suddenly abandon Netanyahu. Well, what do the Israelis think about it? What does the voting public of Israel think about that? You know, they've been withstanding years of being rocketed and then October 7th last year, they get the invasion over the wall into their territory, brutally killing more than a thousand Israelis. So, you know, they kind of like the idea that someone is trying to take out Hamas. Might be a little too brutal for a lot of people's taste, but something is being done about it that they support. Tom, it's worth mentioning also that in addition to Israel going after Hamas, there are many other countries in that region that are thrilled that they're doing so, by the way. You know, it's oh, not that's like all, that is always the case. In these, that's a very good point that many of the countries, I was involved in meetings with other countries at a time when the other country, I'll talk about, you know, one situation in Pakistan. I'm visiting the security services in Islamabad, Pakistan, and we're trying to identify where many of Osama bin Laden's people are that have gone from Afghanistan into northern Pakistan and in the territories to set up safe haven for themselves. The Pakistanis, I'm in meetings where officials from Pakistan meet with us and the CIA and the FBI and say, here is the, here is the coordinates, GPS coordinates of a house that right now we know has 50 of uh, 
of uh, bin Laden's people in this house. Here's the coordinates. Set up your missiles. Dial them in. And then they tell us. And when you do, when you destroy that location, we're going to publicly say, we condemn the United States interfering in our country and our sovereignty and all of that. However, behind the scenes, thank you very much. We're going to so celebrate that. That's exactly what happened. We bombed this location, kill all the people inside of it. Pakistanis go public with the United States has interfered with the sovereignty of our country. And then behind closed doors, come back to the embassy to have a party with us to celebrate what we did. But they do it privately, publicly. Oh, we're outraged with the United States. Said, privately, thank you. And I think that this is also the case with, for example, Saudi Arabia and Israel were just about to sign the next level of accord in the Abraham Accords, on the, just on the verge of signing it back in the fall. And then October 7th happens, and it stops. Now, really, Saudi Arabia is probably applauding the IDF for going into Gaza and wiping, trying to wipe out Hamas because they are deaf themselves on these terrorists. They were the same way when Al-Qaeda was formed by bin Laden with mostly Saudi Arabian uh, members joining that. They did the same thing. They didn't want these terrorists in their territory. Egypt doesn't want to take the Palestinians because they know they kicked out Hamas several years ago, they don't want them back, and they'll be intermingled with the Palestinians. So Egypt, behind the scenes, supporting Israel. Saudi Arabia, behind the scenes, supporting Israel. Many of the neighbors don't want the Palestinian terrorists, but some of them are terrorists. They don't want them either. So all these countries in the neighborhood are publicly saying, well, this is not good that Israel's doing this, and they should stop, and there should be a ceasefire and all that. Deep down, they're supporting Israel. They want these terrorists to wipe out because they're a threat to their own country as well. Trump, didn't you so these, this you international know? political stuff, you know, what you see on CNN, what you see these officials say, they're shocked and outraged and all that. Well, I was involved personally in many of those meetings over the years where they weren't so shocked and outraged after all. You know, Tom, you mentioned something about this Abraham Accord and um moving closer to one between Saudi Arabia and Israel. Correct me if I'm wrong, because it's my understanding that the Saudi government and the Israeli government have already been collaborating on a desalination plant. Do you know anything about that? Yeah, there are quite oh, a number of things. A number of things. They're not really enemies. And Saudi Arabia wants to improve their economy and prosper and, and trade, have a good relationship with Israel. They want that. So this stuff, whether it's a a plant to you know take salt out of the water or whatever it might be, Saudi Arabia is well on board with that. Well, Tom, the thing I also want to go back to, with, which opened this up to discussion, in regards to Schumer and interfering in their governmental process, isn't that what they accuse the Russians of attempting to interfere or influence our election? Am, am yeah. I off? I mean. Is no, anybody... that's the accusation, the accusation, but it really wasn't true, to be honest. Yeah, but my we interfered on. more. We interfered more in Russia back when Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State. He directly interfered. This whole thing with Navalny, he was a tool of Western intelligence to go against Putin, and he only had about five percent of the vote, so he was insignificant. Putin didn't need to kill him; he was a nobody anyway. But that's what what comes up is that we were hiring. And there's some speculation that he was killed by MI6 or the CIA, the violent name I'm talking about. But there was speculation going back that, that we tried to take Putin out through election interference. Well, Tom, that, that's my whole point. The very same demographic in our country that made a false accusation about Russia interfering in our election or trying to influence our election are actively without equivocation doing so in Israel because it doesn't lend itself to our political liking. I do realize they're trying to save Biden's administration and have him reelected. What I also find a bit ironic is that Schumer is doing something to undermine Israel's efforts. And Schumer's Jewish, but you and I both know. Schiff, Nadler, Blumenthal, 
Schumer, Sanders, they've all sat silent on this thing. Yeah, is, is that like you know, the Republicans that don't, you know, don't actually say what they mean? You know, maybe Schumer's a gino, Jewish in name only. I don't know. <laughs> he, I don't oh, know. Did you just coin but a it, phrase today, Tom? <laughs> I hope so. But in any event, yeah. Yeah, so all of a sudden, Schumer is more concerned about the young Palestinian vote, which Biden is more concerned with, than he is about anything Israel does. And I'm telling you, I have no doubt in my mind that Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Jordan, even Jordan, it's unusual because the population of Jordan is predominantly Palestinian, and the wife of the king of Jordan is a Palestinian woman. So yet, you don't see them severely critical of, of uh, Israel and the attacks that they're doing in Gaza. Those countries in the neighborhood, they don't want Hamas. You don't see them saying, okay, send the refugees here. They don't want them. That's why Egypt has put their army at the border of Egypt and uh, in Rafa at the border with Israel because they don't want Palestinians coming into their country. They, they got rid of them already once. They got rid of the Muslim Brotherhood. The, the, the former uh, group that ended up evolving into Hamas. They got rid of all that. They don't want them back. Saudi Arabia never supported terrorism at all. Even bin Laden, whose father gave him $50 million to be rich, they didn't want him. They didn't want bin Laden's people. And as long as bin Laden didn't attack Saudi structure in Saudi Arabia, then they could stay if they, if they behaved. And occasionally they didn't behave and Saudi Arabia crushed a small group. But they but Saudi Arabia pretty much said, you know, stay out of stay out of here. Don't do it here. You want to attack the US or the Russians in Afghanistan, good for you. But don't do it here. Um, we're going to end the show for now. And we're going to come back on the next podcast and we're gonna have a discussion about this media oversight, something that I've spoken to redundantly, how there is basically no oversight over the media, and I don't know of another institution that lacks it. Thank you for joining us today. You can reach us at operationtruth at gmail.com. Please communicate with us, um, argue with us, just do it with dignity. We'd love to have you guys call in at some point. We're trying to create another platform to enhance the availability of ourselves. I mean, you can just think, Tom, you can see Tom's a guy you want to ask a ton of questions to because of his experience, um, not only with the FBI, but just his understanding of the country and the world. 